Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alan Leventhal, Chairman of the Boston University Board of Trustees. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, it is my pleasure to call this special convocation for the inauguration of Robert A. Brown as the University's 10th President to order. We would like to welcome you today your presence honors us. I ask that you honor America by singing the national anthem to be played by the faculty brass ensemble of Boston University. Following the, uh, please remain standing for the invocation to be delivered by Rabbi Joseph Pollock, director of the Hilla Foundation at Boston University. Kishem Adonai Ekra, Havu Godel Leloheinu, let us call upon the God of mercy, let us bring glory to the Lord of Justice, quotes, And King David arose with all the people that were with him to bring up to the city of David the ark of God, Lord of hosts, which David did with great joy. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. End of quote, 2 Samuel 6. 
what is in this ark that David dances before it? Among other objects, the fragments of the stone tablets that Moses had smashed together with their replacement with the Ten Commandments also carved upon them. We are gathered here as we begin the inauguration of Robert Brown as 10th president of Boston University. We are gathered here to call upon your holy name, almighty God. We pray that his tenure be guided by both the broken and the whole tablets, by the shattered wisdom of the past and the divine inspiration of the present and the future. We pray that you protect Robert Brown and his family from the ravages of public office, that you grant him the health and stamina to lead and inspire with humility, yet without faltering. Help him complete his charge, the preservation and advancement of knowledge and the education of young and old. Be at his side, almighty God, whenever he seeks you out. Be at his side, even when he doesn't. And above all, God of justice and God of mercy, even as you did with King David 3,000 years ago, when Robert Brown dances before the ark, dance with him, Lord, dance with him. And Omar, amen. And let us say, amen. This afternoon's ceremony is the centerpiece of a number of inaugural concerts, receptions, and symposia, which represent hundreds of hours of planning in coordination by the dedicated staff of this university. All of our celebrations have been executed under the watchful direction and guidance of a devoted inaugural advisory committee co-chaired by our trustees, Elaine Kirschenbaum and Roscoe Giles. Thank you, Elaine and Roscoe, for your extraordinary work. It is now my pleasure to call upon Trustee Kirschenbaum. Thank you, Chairman Leventhal. I am thrilled to stand at this podium today to bring greetings from the Presidential Inaugural Advisory Committee to our honored guests as we celebrate the inauguration of Boston University's 10th president. I wish to acknowledge my co-chair of the Presidential Inaugural Advisory Committee, Professor Roscoe Giles, and all of its members for their wonderful work in bringing this celebration together. I cannot begin to describe the creativity, the enthusiasm, talent, and dedication to Boston University that this core group showed over the last few months. And at last, we are finally here celebrating yet another exciting chapter for Boston University. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I wish to thank them for their incredible efforts. Some nine months ago, Bob Brown assumed the presidency of Boston University, and almost immediately, you could feel an overwhelming energy on the campus as Bob quickly demonstrated his brilliant qualities as a leader and a and a scholar. Boston University is poised and ready to take over ever more exhilarating challenges in higher education under the leadership of Dr. Robert Brown. This is a new chapter in the history of Boston University, and like many great works of literature, new chapters build upon the preceding chapters. Boston University has a rich and glorious history, and the presidency of Robert Brown will be built upon the presidencies of the nine presidents who have come before him. 
While we stand here today to forge our future, we cannot do so without celebrating our legacy. President Brown, I thank you for the role you have allowed me to play in this historic day. And on behalf of the Presidential Inaugural Advisory Committee, we wish you the very best of luck as you forge Boston University's next exciting chapter. The inauguration of a university president is one of the oldest of academic ceremonies. Rooted in tradition and tracing its origins to the earliest of the world's universities, it is a celebration of the entire academy. Participating in today's ceremony are 96 delegates from universities, colleges, and learned societies from around the country representing these honored guests in bringing greetings to the new president of Boston University is Dr. Lawrence Bacow, president of Tufts University. President Bacow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. A former president of Brown, Henry Riston, once described the challenges faced by every college or university president. The president, Riston said, is expected to be an educator, to have been at some time a scholar, to have judgment about finance, to know something about construction, maintenance, and labor policy, to speak virtually continuously in words that charm and never offend, to take bold positions with which no one will ever disagree, to consult everyone and follow all proffered advice, and to do everything through committees but with great speed and without error. To this I might add to raise money unceasingly without ever seeming to ask, and to eat splendid meals nonstop in service to one's institution without ever gaining a pound. The trustees of Boston University have chosen wisely. I have been fortunate to work closely with President Brown during his prior life at a small New England technical college located on the other side of the Charles River. In Bob Brown, Boston University has a leader who is more than able to meet Henry Riston's challenges. He is a man of immense talent and intellect, extraordinary energy, basic decency, and bedrock integrity. Moreover, he brings to this job a secret weapon, Beverly Brown. Together, they will leave their mark on this great university. At MIT, Bob Brown was known as a scholar's scholar, and as a teacher's teacher. I am confident that in due course, he will also be known as a president's president. Bob, on behalf of the fellowship of college and university presidents throughout the region and the nation, on behalf of all members of the academy so assembled, I bring you greetings, we wish you good luck, and to Boston University, we offer our sincere congratulations on your appointment and inauguration. Thank you very much. One hundred and thirty-seven years ago, three successful Boston businessmen, all deeply committed to religious, educational, and philanthropic programs, petitioned the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to grant a charter which would create Boston University. On May 26, 1869, this charter was granted to Isaac Rich, Jacob Sleeper, and Lee Claflin, the founders of our university. Today, Representing the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we are delighted to have the Treasurer and Receiver General, the Honorable Timothy P. Cahill, who is also 
a 1981 graduate of the university's College of Arts and Sciences, Treasurer Cahill. I would say it's nice to be back, but this building wasn't here when I was here, so it's nice to be here, and you folks are, those students are very, very lucky to have such a great facility. As State Treasurer, I am honored to take part in this important ceremony and bring the greetings in a warm Commonwealth of Massachusetts welcome to Dr. Robert A. Brown as the 10th president of Boston University. During its 137 years of service to Massachusetts, Boston University has become an integral part of the Commonwealth's educational, economic, and cultural fabric. In addition, there are over 80,000 Boston, Boston University alumni living in Massachusetts, of which I am one, who play a role in the state's political, educational, business, and entertainment communities on a daily basis. In order to ensure that the university remains among the elite, the elite educational institutions, it requires the highest level of leadership and innovation in the office of president. Dr. Brown has proven to be exactly the type of leader that Boston University needs. During his distinguished career at MIT, he has set the standards for scholarly accomplishments, academic innovation, and institutional leadership. He will bring strength and stability to the presidency and is the right person to help guide BU through the challenges of the coming decade. On, on behalf of the Commonwealth, it is my privilege to welcome Dr. Brown to the Boston University family it would not be a BU event without some controversy, so it does, that does make me feel like I'm back at BU. <laughs> I just hope she's removed before Dr. Brown gets up here to speak. Congratulations, Dr. Brown. I look forward to working with you to ensure a successful future for Boston University, its students, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you. Although chartered in 1869, Boston University traces its origin some 30 years earlier to a small seminary in Newbury, Vermont, which was first moved to Concord, New Hampshire, then to Boston, where it was renamed the Boston Theological Institute. The Institute became the founding school of Boston University, now the School of Theology. From our earliest days to the present, Boston University recognizes its special, special relationship with and its responsibilities to the great city of Boston. Lemuel Merlin, the third president of Boston University, effectively defined this bond by the simple phrase, in the heart of the city, in the service of the city a belief we still hold true, bringing greetings from our host city. It is my privilege to in now introduce the Honorable Thomas M. Menino, Mayor of the City of Boston. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Alan. Dr. Brown, faculty, staff, and students, I am honored to bring greetings from the city of Boston on this great occasion. The inauguration of Dr. Robert Brown as president of Boston University is an important day for both the university and the entire city. Here in Boston, a city renowned for institutions of higher education BU has established itself as a civic leader. You know, the university has a strong partnership with the Boston Public Schools. Each year, BU gives up to 60 full scholarships to Boston Public School graduates. And the City Lab program helps prepare young people for careers in health service and science. 
President Brown has already demonstrated that he'll maintain BU's commitment to the young people of our city. He is currently serving on the search committee for the next superintendent of the Boston Public Schools. BU is also committed to being a good neighbor. The university has helped to alleviate the housing crunch in Boston by building dormitories to house their undergraduate students on campus. And BU students are out in the community every day volunteering in Boston Public Schools in the neighborhoods of Boston. BU Medical School and Boston Medical Center through their community health clinics are at the forefront of ensuring that all Boston residents have access to medical and dental care regardless of the ability to pay. Looking ahead, I have no doubt that President Brown's commitment to excellence will strengthen BU's position as a global leader in higher education. Mr. President, I am so thrilled to stand here today ready to work with you at this terrific academic institution. Thank you for your commitment. You have already demonstrated to working with our city. I wish you the best of luck in your new adventure. And let me just say over the last several months, working with Dr. Brown on several issues that pertain to our city, he gets it. He knows how to work with people. That makes a big difference in our relationship. Dr. Brown is, we're so fortunate to have him as head of Boston University at this time in the history of this university. To the faculty, the staff and students here at UBU, I say congratulations. To the search committee, keep on trying, you did a good job. You did a good job of picking a great person for leadership of this university at this time. Congratulations, and we really welcome Dr. Brown to the community of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. From the date of its chartering, Boston University has never discriminated according to race, sex, ethnic background, or affili religious affiliation in the admissions of, of students. We are proud of this tradition, and we're also more proud that today our student body represents all 50 states and territories of the United States in more than 140 foreign countries. This tremendous diversity of talents and interests among our student body brings a richness of human experience to our campus which few can match. Representing the students of Boston University at this afternoon ceremony is Mr. Jonathan Marker, president of the Boston University Student Union. Jonathan. Fellow students, alumni, faculty, staff, trustees, family, friends, and of course, President Brown, welcome on behalf of the student body. It is my pleasure to be here today to make this presentation on behalf of the students of Boston University to our new president. For any of you who have met President Brown, he may have shared his philosophy of telling Boston University's story of making sure that the good we do in Boston, in Massachusetts, and in the world is heard loud and clear. As a true Boston patriot, Melnia Cass proclaimed, I am convinced that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. The harder I work, the more I live. When the student union was considering gifts for Dr. Brown, we had lots of ideas, but nothing had the right feel till we stumbled on the idea of community service. Community service fit President Brown's philosophy was something that students could help with, and most importantly, something we could all be excited about. At first, we only asked for one hour from each undergraduate student this semester. Uh, and we soon realized that that was well over our heads. 
professors began asking their classes to help out, RAs signed up for themselves and for their floors, members of the community caught on and had us help out with unique projects in their neighborhoods. When all was said and done, our goal of 16,000 hours was pretty far off. We had amassed 41,754.75 hours. <laughs> This included entries of people not only in Boston, but across the world, former alums especially. And that is the equivalent of one person working nonstop 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without pay for four and three quarters years. We also had over 230 volunteers come out for a day of service on a Saturday morning. And for any of you who haven't been in college in a while, a Saturday morning is a pretty special time when students usually get to sleep in. But once again, our community exceeded its, its expectations, recording over 1,100 hours of service over five hours in one afternoon. So I stand here today and reject the notion that students are apathetic. This feat was amazing, and I have never been more proud to be part of this community. 41,754 and three quarters hours of service have been completed in your honor, President Brown. We've compiled this book, titled after the vision of one of Boston University's former presidents, Lemuel Merlin, in the heart of the city, in the service of the city, so that you can always remember this occasion and as a constant reminder and inspiration to ourselves of what we can do when we work together. I hope we will continue to show the Boston area and the world that we will not rest on some of these issues and that we are here to work for change by going above and beyond our past accomplishments. Thank you for inspiring this project, President Brown. Your dedication to and enthusiasm for Boston University keep me excited every day to see where we are headed. It has been my honor to work with you this past year. Boston University is committed to maintaining rigorous standards of teaching and scholarship in its classrooms and laboratories. It is the faculty of Boston University which bears the primary responsibility for upholding these standards as they guide our students in the search of, for truth. Representing the faculty of Boston University is Professor Roscoe C. Giles, chairman of the faculty council the elected body which represents the interests of the university faculty. In his capacity as chairman of the faculty council, Professor Giles has served as a member of the board of trustees. Professor Giles. Thank you, Chairman Leventhal. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be here on this occasion to bring greetings from the faculty of Boston University, both to Bob Brown and all the uh, people assembled here. Across the 17 schools and colleges of the university, the faculty is chiefly responsible for the core education and scholarly missions of the university. We have the privilege of working with an outstanding group of students as represented by John Marker, as well as working with the administration towards these ends. We've also had the privilege during the past months of working uh, for the first time with Dr. Brown in his role as president. We've welcomed him to our community. We've had the pleasure of thoughtful, caring, inclusive interactions with him, open and honest discussions, and benefits uh, from his great wisdom and thoughtfulness. We've been inspired by his vision of Boston University's greatness and we look forward enthusiastically to forging the future of Boston University under Bob Brown's leadership. Thank you. The alumni of Boston University carry the spirit and ideals of the University into the larger world. 
The Board of Trustees is grateful for the dedication and support which the alumni show for their alma mater. And we welcome the many of you who are in the audience today and those of you who are watching these ceremonies via the world, world Wide Web. Representing more than 260,000 alumni of Boston University is University Trustee and President of the Boston University Alumni Council, Ron Garrix. Trustee Garrix. Thank you, Chairman Leventhal. I am very honored to help celebrate the inauguration of the new president of Boston University. On a day like today, it is appropriate to have the involvement of not only the student body, but also the alumni. And I have that great honor today to speak on their behalf. Boston University has a great heritage. For when over 150 years, graduates of Boston University have left a lasting and deep mark on the world. Due to extraordinary leadership at the highest levels, Boston University students have greatly benefited by the values and knowledge imparted by the exceptional faculty and staff at every level. Already, the new president has made time to meet with the students, the faculty, and the alumni. He has communicated to all of us his unyielding integrity, tremendous energy, and inspiring vision. He is just the right person to lead Boston University today and into the future. On behalf of the alumni who live and work around the world, I offer our congratulations, support, and best wishes. Thank you to Boston University for the opportunity and the honor to speak on behalf of the alumni today. And congratulations to President Brown. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, for many years, Boston University has been able to turn to our next speaker for guidance, support, direction, and leadership. In every instance, he responded and made the university a better and stronger institution. And so when it was time to select someone to chair the Presidential Search Committee, it came as no surprise that we turn to him again. David D'Alessandro is a corporate leader, a civic leader, a best-selling author, and the BU trustee who led the search that brought Bob Brown to this inauguration day. Once again, we are a better and stronger institution because of David. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Vice Chairman of the Boston University Board of Trustees, David D'Alessandro. You know, a couple of days ago, I called uh, Dr. Brown and talked to him about today's events. And uh, he said to me, um, and I said to him that today was his day. He politely and in his manner, quickly corrected me and said, no, it's the university's day. So in the next few minutes I have in celebrating Dr. Brown, Dr. Brown's day and the university's day, I'd like to share a little bit about what ha really happened in the search process. Since it was a kind of mysterious process to a lot of people, I thought this might be the time to share a little bit of it. But first I'd like to acknowledge some people that are here. Like many of the people uh, out there, um, I participated in a lot of committees in my life, but I've never participated with or served with a group of people as dedicated, unselfish, and as focused as your search committee. They were remarkable, and it was an honor to lead them. Most of them are here today, and I ask you to join me in thanking them. You 
know, I, I, it was a remarkable process because on the very first day, we, we actually had some agreement on something. Uh, aside from Danish or the normal things committees do, and we, we decided on two guiding lights for this process. Uh, the board had already directed us that they wanted candidates that had the ability to serve for an extended period of time, uh, a minimum of uh, five to ten years was the range. Um, and that translated um, at our level into the fact that um, as some of our committee members I think from the physics or math department quickly ascertained that this would influence, this decision would influence uh, hundreds of thousands of students who would in turn exponentially influence uh, millions of lives as, uh, as artists, musicians, business people, scientists, journalists, educated, educators, elected officials, and certainly as, as future parents. It helped focus us immediately on our task. And that helped us to another guiding light, which was to put aside our individual biases as to what each of us thought should be the right candidate. And so we began a process of listening to what you thought before we even looked at candidate backgrounds. Now, recognizing this is an academic community, I don't want you to get the impression that uh, we only sang Kumbaya and never disagreed on anything, because um, we disagreed plenty. But on the two fundamental points, staying focused and listening carefully, and, car and carefully to you, we never wavered. And it took time. Um, there's a lot of you. Um, and we listened and to anyone who wanted to speak up. Groups, individuals, students, departments, professors, alumni, retirees, staff. Um, and you talked to us in in-person meetings, at public meetings, anonymously, through websites, virtually any way, any way one could imagine. Now, it'll probably come as no surprise to people here, there are some very strong opinions on this campus. Now, if we combined all those opinions, our new president, um, we felt, would have to leap over tall buildings in a single bound, be faster than a speeding bullet, and unlike Superman, not be vulnerable to kryptonite. But slowly and surely, the collective voice and focus came. came. You asked us, and our board asked us, to find a person with these credentials academic excellence, financial sophistication, great listening and communication skills, years of classroom experience, leadership skills in a complex urban environment, prodigious fundraising abilities, and a successful government affairs track record. We talked to hundreds, if not thousands of people here. And um, when I talked to John Silver, John was always, as always, very clear. He said, find someone who sees the future well and will act in the best interest ahead of that future. And so off we went. The only problem was, how was it possible that we were going to find one person that could have excelled in all those areas and be under 125 years old? Um, we've never talked publicly about this before, and um, I know this will be just between us today. Um, we saw hundreds of resumes, and one way or the other, we talked to dozens of people, U.S. Senators, Cabinet Secretaries, University and College Presidents, Provosts, Deans. We spoke to Fortune 500 CEOs, internal candidates, and even to former country presidents. But over this period of time, these months, the pack began to thin, and one person began to clearly emerge. Bob Brown, just across the river, was rising above a number of people who had managed that 125 years experience into 50 chronological ones. So I went back to my notes this weekend to share some of the thoughts about Bob Brown during that, that iterative process. And here are some verbatim entries from my journal. Brown does something many candidates appear to have a problem with. He actually listens to the entire question, 
before attempting to answer. His curiosity is vast. He's the only candidate who asks more questions than are asked of him. He has spent time studying us because by the time we're now in the second interview and third interviews, without notes, he is citing BU statistics and facts. And while not the only candidate to have done that, he was the only accurate candidate to have done that. <laughs> He fully, this is a note I made it. he fully recognizes on his own and by name the important contributions of President Silver Westing and Chebanian. He has a keen understanding of how urban universities need to operate both on a macro and micro level. His inclusive management style is apparent, but simultaneous to his admission that he does not have all the answers. And so, and we had other candidates that were, who were narrowing at the time. And we, so we, be, we began to push Bob and others uh, in subsequent interviews. Uh, now, given that his chosen field is chemical engineering, he was peppered with questions about literature, music, the arts, law, the sciences, business, and a series of other disciplines. And his knowledge, but more importantly, his appreciation for disciplines other than his own w was truly breathtaking. We even asked him about the role of sports on campus, assuming with all due respect to MIT, he might not exactly be up to speed on that one. <laughs> but we were wrong. Bob thought, told us very thoughtfully about the importance of intramural as well as interscholastic sports in students' roles. A lot of examples. That'll give you a little bit of an understanding. But we were not satisfied. We decided that unless we had a truly extraordinary candidate, we were going to start over again. So I'm going to tell you just two stories that, in my mind, made the difference. Um, it was a beautiful Sunday afternoon, about this time of year last year, uh, when um, Bob and Beverly and I visited the Sloan House. Um, Aram Chamanian uh, was kind enough to um, find something to do that afternoon. And um, I don't know about you, but when I was, if I'm gonna look at a new house where I might live for 10 some odd years, I'd wanna see the living quarters. Uh, I've never been in this loan house, so I, when I opened the door, a bit like a Century 21 real estate agent, um, Beverly and Bob did something quite unusual. They headed for the basement. How many people would head for the basement? And they headed for the basement because they wanted to know where the chairs were stacked. That this is the university president's house, it is the university's house. How are we going to possibly entertain for fundraising purposes, for alumni, for faculty, for the many functions? And they spent virtually their entire, I don't think they spent two minutes in the upstairs rooms where they would live much of their personal lives. That told me a little bit about extraordinary. And then I'll tell you a question. I wish I could remember which, which person asked it, but I don't. Bob was asked in one of our meetings, now 10 years from now, how will you judge whether or not you've been successful? Now other candidates have been asked this question. And um, there were a lot of pat answers. Most of them had to do with SAT scores, uh, admission standards, uh, whether or not uh, new buildings were built. Bob had a very interesting set of comments. He said. Ten years from now, uh, when I'm walking across this campus as perhaps president or perhaps by then a tenured faculty member, I expect and hope that people will know my name, be comfortable in calling me Bob, and that I will know them. Many will be enthusiastically continuing the great legacies of this academic community. And I'm hopeful, and I will judge my success on that plus that an equal amount of people will enthusiastically be telling me they are working on fields and projects not even dreamed about today. That's when I'll know if I've been successful. And that's when we knew we had an extraordinary candidate. Bob, you are absolutely right when you told me two days ago, this is Boston University's day. But that is only so because you've accepted this challenge. Thank you.
I am uh, pleased now to introduce uh, the Inner Strength Gospel Choir. Will the uh, University Marshal please escort President Robert A. Brown to the podium. Robert Brown, the students, faculty, and alumni of this university have joined the members of the Board of Trustees in recommending your appointment as President of Boston University. In appointing you to these duties, the Board of Trustees expresses its profound confidence in you and your abilities as you lead Boston University in the years ahead. 
we charge you to uphold Boston University's tradition of learning, virtue, and piety, while at the same time shaping this university to meet the ever-changing concerns and problems of our age. The university's colors, scarlet, representing courage and life itself, and white, representing the blending of all virtues, are entrusted to you. We now further commit to your care and custody the charter of Boston University. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Corporation of Boston University and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I pronounce you Robert A. Brown, the 10th President of Boston University. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my great honor to present to you the 10th president of Boston University, Robert Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please. I think I'll wait a second. Thank you to Mayor Menino, State Treasurer Cahill, members of the Boston University Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, students, and guests. I stand before you humbled by your response, touched by your participation in today's events, and grateful for the warm welcome that the entire Boston University community has extended to Beverly and to me. People who know me well realize that I don't change settings easily. I am a creature of habit and connections. It was approximately a year ago, as David has said, when I began the conversation with members of the Boston University family that led us being here today. The members of the Presidential Search Committee, led by David D'Alessandro, expressed their deep connection to Boston University and conveyed their hopes for the future. They drew me into the opportunity to serve the university, and I am deeply grateful for their confidence in me. It is a tremendous honor and responsibility to serve Boston University as your president. I pledge to do everything I can to earn that trust you have placed in me. I must pause here to thank the most important person in my life, my wife and sweetheart, Beverly, for her unyielding support during our 37 years together. She is my standard for the highest quality of character, my constant friend and my soulmate, and my companion and confidant on this great adventure. I am truly blessed to have her at my side. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge my two sons, Ryan and Keith, who are my greatest sources of pride, and two people who can humble, humble me in any number of ways. There are many things I want to say this afternoon to the entire Boston University community, our faculty, staff, students, and alumni. My remarks will focus on Boston University as today's events are a time for celebrating our legacy and forging our future. I believe these words eloquently capture the Boston University I have come to understand, where the study of our past is important to defining the core values of the university, where we take stock in our accomplishments as an institution, 
and where there is palpable excitement and gathering energy to move forward and define our future. Let me speak about our legacy. From its roots as a Methodist seminary, Boston University has been a story of continual growth and transformation. From a collection of buildings scattered about Boston at the turn of the 20th century, Boston University is now a teeming campus stretched along Commonwealth Avenue in a modern healthcare complex in the heart of Boston South End. From a university that began serving local residents who commuted to class, Boston University has grown into a residential campus attracting students from all across America and from around the world. Today, our faculty and students form a community of teaching, learning, and discovery rich in intellectual diversity. Our impact has been enormous with 260,000 living alumni of our undergraduate and graduate programs, and our family is continually expanding. Our legacy is as a private university with wonderful breadth and depth. For undergraduates, there is a kaleidoscope of opportunities, each built on a liberal arts core and with specializations across the spectrum of disciplines. We offer a liberal arts education with all manner of concentrations in humanities, social science, and sciences, and more professionally focused degrees in communication, management, performing arts, education, and engineering, to name just a few. Everywhere we strive to graduate edu educated, informed citizens who can reason about important issues in the world, who can take their place in a global economy, and who can lead our society. At no time in history has the mission of educating our youth for the challenges of citizenship and for participating in a competitive society been more important to this country and to the world. In parallel with our commitment to undergraduate education, there are nationally known graduate professional programs in the age-old age -old triad of law, medicine, and theology, as well as all the relative newcomers, such as business, communications, public health, and the performing arts. At Boston University, as elsewhere, professional and graduate educations are cornerstones of the modern research university. Across both our campuses, we are blessed with faculty who work at the leading edges of their disciplines, producing research and scholarship befitting a great research university, and who also care deeply about education and student learning. Great faculty who care about teaching, and what variety of faculty we have. World-class high-energy physicists, talented musicians, award-winning journalists, historians, philosophers, doctors, dentists, and even, even engineers. To the faculty, you are the university's most important resource, and I pledge to support your efforts aimed at continuing excellence in education and research. Diversity and inclusion also have been cornerstones of our legacy throughout the history of Boston University. For example, when Boston Medical School opened its doors in 1873, it admitted women and African Americans. Moreover, Boston University was the first American university to award a PhD degree to a woman, Helen McGill, in 1877. The first woman to join the Massachusetts Bar was an 1881 Boston University Law School graduate, Leela Josephine Robinson. And the School of Theology awarded the first degree in theology to a woman in 1876, Anna Oliver, although the Methodist Church would not ordain her. The sculpture, Free at Last, by Sergio Castello, that adorns the plaza at Marsh Chapel as a tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and the interdenominational services that are performed inside the chapel are continuing recognition that the legacy of inclusion lives on. The university's accomplishments and impact are intertwined with the city of Boston. Today, over 12,000 undergraduate students live within Boston University's residential community. But when they, these students walk out of their residences or classrooms, they quickly arrive on Commonwealth Avenue. They see the bee line, and they know they're in Boston. Mayor Menino, we revel in being Boston's university. We are extremely proud of our heritage of engagement with and service to the city. Our engagement is visible today in many ways, 
most notably through our partnership with Boston Medical Center in providing health care for all the people of Boston and in medical education. Through the continued access of Boston residents to the university, through our efforts in managing the Chelsea school system, and through a myriad of other educational programs and services that engage our students and faculty with city children and residents. Today, students come to Boston University because of the high quality and variety of our educational programs, because of the quality of student life, and because of Boston. They are engaged. Under the masthead of every bug does its part, our students organized the inaugural gift that has resulted in over 41,700 hours of service to the community and has made the bright yellow Bobby Brown t-shirt a campus icon. <laughs> I am deeply grateful to all of this outpouring of community service in my name and the name of the university. Our legacy of engagement and our entrepreneurial spirit has spread Boston University's impact around the globe through international programs for Boston-based students and for students in their home countries. What began as engagement with Boston has spread to undergraduate programs in London, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and Dresden, and to education programs focused on public health in Africa and research on emerging infectious diseases around the world. We should be extremely proud of the leadership that Boston University is demonstrating in the focus on infectious disease research. These diseases, many of which have been characterized as third world problems, have been understudied in this country. Our conviction to invest in research will lead to much needed treatments and vaccines. As has been said, the third president of Boston University, Lemuel Merlin, said in his 1911 inaugural address that the goal of our university was to be in the heart of the city, in the service of the city. We have fulfilled President Merlin's goal and accomplished much more. Today, we can boast that Boston University is a great private research university in the heart of the city, engaged in the city and the world. It is my honor to acknowledge the presence on the podium of three past presidents of Boston University, each of whom has played pivotal roles in shaping our institution, Aram Trebanium, John Wesling, and John R. Silver. These gentlemen, <laughs> these gentlemen, especially Dr. Silber, have helped mold the Boston University that I have described to you and have set the foundation for our future. And now the future. Let me begin with a little personal evaluation of myself. As has been noted several times, I am an engineer. And with this background comes my instincts to jump in and work to help people solve problems. I do have this inclination probably to a fault. I also have a propensity for numbers. I am known to say, where is the data on an issue? I try to communicate an understanding about the university to all who will listen in the hope of creating shared understanding and common cause. This is not a simple goal because of the complexity inherent in the operation of a large private university. I also strive to live according to Albert Einstein's dictum of make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler, although I have mixed success. What is less appreciated about me is that behind this analytical facade, I have a very active imagination. In my earlier days as a faculty member, I imagined the solution of mathematical problems coming from research and lectures that fit perfectly together. OK, I admit these were strange dreams. But they were harmless in that they were only shared with a few colleagues, with either the graduate student who was toiling in research or the students in a class who were struggling with not so simple explanations of concepts and techniques. Today, I find myself in the highly exposed position of sharing with you my imagined hopes for Boston University. I will do my best to make it simple. In my short time here, 
I have begun constructing an image of what our university can become for us and for the future students and faculty who join our community. I cannot give you a prescription, prescription for the institution, but I can talk about five words that are shaping the images I see. They are learning, excellence, connectivity, engagement, and inclusion. Learning, above all other descriptors I can imagine, learning describes Boston University today and in the future. We have been and will continue to strive to be a learning community for all faculty, students, and staff. Learning flourishes here in the traditional classroom settings. However, equally as important, learning occurs by engagement of all of us in our campus community in Boston and the world around us. This learning community encompasses the undergraduate student who helped generate almost 42,000 hours of community service for a gift to the university. The student who rides the BU bus to the medical campus to work on an undergraduate research project. The dental student who participates in the APEX program that gives, a de gives dental service to underserved communities in Boston. Or the law student who volunteers at a legal clinic. It includes all the students who study away from our campus and those who intern in Boston and around the world. It includes the spectacular evening lectures by Professor Ellie Wiesel and the readings sponsored by the Creative Writing Program and other campus organizations. I imagine Boston University becomes known, known for this broader definition of learning. I can think of no better university to have this goal in no better way to enrich the education of our students. Excellence. Instilling the never-ending drive for excellence in everything we do has been and will remain a central theme of our university. Whether it is promoting excellence in teaching scholarship and research or in providing dining for our undergraduates, we must insist on the highest quality just as we demand the same quality in our students' work. We will continue to build academic excellence on the pillars of our faculty and graduate programs, as it is the individual creativity of our faculty and the energy emanating from their research and scholarship which inspires and nourishes our learning community. Connectivity. Perhaps the most challenging vision I have for Boston University is to be known as one connected, integrated community of scholars and students, researchers, and learners. While representing excellence in our individual disciplines, while educating the next generation of scholars and leaders, we have an enormous opportunity. We can become the large private university known for thinking about the whole. This concept takes many forms, from connecting the Boston University alumni community to their university, to connecting students from the schools and colleges across our campuses, to strengthening our connections to the city and the world, to bringing together our intellectual breadth to focus on, ch focus on challenges and research in a, and on undergraduate education. We have the opportunity, opportunity to lead in interdisciplinary research. This initiative is well underway, especially in interactions between the medical school and academic departments along the Charles River. Here, colleagues have joined together and successfully launched collaborative initiatives, including major programs in biomedical engineering and bioinformatics. We are at the forefront of these areas because our faculty foresaw the blurring of the boundaries between traditional biological science, physical science, and mathematics. In modern research in life sciences. We will build on these successes and create more opportunities for collaboration in interdisciplinary innovation. In a larger context, we all agree about the magnitude of the challenges faced by society. We agree that significant progress will require innovation that goes well beyond any single discipline. For example, consider the challenges of developing an environmentally sustainable energy policy or of provide, providing affordable health care for us and for the world. 
Boston University will play a role in shaping the dialogue and defining the approaches to these challenges by bringing together the strength and diversity of the university. The Pardee Center's successful conferences on global health and human development and on the role of religion in the longer range future are indications of the enthusiasm our faculty has for truly interdisciplinary collaboration. Perhaps our greatest opportunity for connectivity lies in the potential to create a truly unique undergraduate educational experience. We have the resources to fuse a 21st century liberal arts education with opportunities for students to concentrate in professional disciplines. Today, our undergraduate education does not demand a choice between becoming well-educated and providing for a professional career. We work hard to balance these objectives, but we can go further. We can pioneer the new educational balance between professional and personal development and develop a set of opportunities that resonate for students across all of our schools and colleges. We can be increasingly known for graduating teachers with rich foundations in science and mathematics, for artists with liberal arts backgrounds, engineers and managers with the humanities and social science underpinnings needed to work effectively in international settings, and journalists with a deep understanding of historical and social political context. In my image of our undergraduate environment, we can apply Boston University's enormous resources to create a nearly boundaryless educational opportunity with the arts and sciences at the core, but with the limit but not the limit of an undergraduate experience. As a newcomer to campus, it is with great trepidation that I think about the future of undergraduate education at Boston University. As so many university presidencies have died on the mountain of educational change. But discussions with our faculty have convinced me there is energy here to take on this challenge, and we will together. Engagement. A university in the 21st century cannot be an ivory tower. Creating knowledge for society and educating our future generations is a contact sport. Our university, our students, and faculty must be engaged in all facets of the world. I imagine Boston University being known as a place for students and faculty who clamor for this engagement, whether in Boston or abroad. Said another way, if you are looking for the adiabatic academic cloisters of the past, don't look to Boston University. I think we could tell that today. There are many questions. What forms will engagement take in the 21st century? How will we best educate our students for participating in the world? What will Boston University's role be in the development of global private higher education? I believe the answers to these questions are interrelated. The concept of a university is changing as the world becomes more interconnected, as our students look toward their education to prepare them more for full participation in it, and as students around the world are seeking the kind of education offered here. It is timely that we develop a strategy for Boston University's role in the evolution of global higher education. Inclusion. The legacy of Boston University demands that we do everything in our power to make our campus inclusive of all people who have the intellect and drive to be members of our community. Inclusion means men and women faculty of all races and backgrounds working together in research, education, and leadership. Inclusion means students of different races, nationalities, and socioeconomic backgrounds learning and living together. A great university must be a meritocracy based on openness and empowerment of all of its faculty and students. The founders of Boston University had this dream and we will honor it. To achieve this goal with our student body, we must aggressively recruit and find financial aid for students who do not have the resources to attend this university. This hurdle will be large. It will be one of our biggest challenges as we do not have a large financial endowment to be used for funding student financial aid. We must raise funds to support the undergraduate student financial aid required 
to increase the access of Boston University for students from all socioeconomic backgrounds. I will be asking our alumni and friends to help us take on this challenge. The focus on access to the university also comes together in efforts to increase the flow of qualified city students. We, may, we can make a difference in this crucial arena. It is inspiring to, to me to share this goal with so many at Boston University who are already involved in outreach to K through 12 education in our cities. These colleagues bring the same passion to making a difference in the lives of younger inner city children as they are bringing to teaching and research on our campus. Today, Boston University is one of the premier large private universities in the world. Focusing on learning, excellence, connectivity, engagement, and inclusion can make us a better place to learn and discover. I truly believe that universities are places where dreams come true, where having an imagination is paramount, and where hard work and intelligence are all that matters to excel in education and research. My most profound goal is to help Boston University be this type of institution for our students and faculty. I commit my energy. I look forward to joining with all of you to make this vision a future and a reality. Thank you again for joining me today to celebrate Boston University. I now have the privilege of introducing a very special part of today's ceremony, which is not listed in your program. Inaugural celebration was composed to honor Robert Brown and to mark his installation as Boston University's 10th president. The work is written for three trumpets and three trombones. The composer, Theodore Antonou, has been a professor of music theory and composition in the University School of Music since 1978 and is renowned as a composer, conductor, and educator. Among his many pursuits, Professor Antonou is artistic director of the contemporary music ensemble Aaliyah III. This piece was premiered last week at our inauguration concert in Carnegie Hall, and we are delighted to have it performed for us again today.
Will all members of this assembly please rise and sing as the faculty brass ensemble plays the Boston University song, Clarissima. The words can be found on page 15 of your program. Following Clarissima, please remain standing as the Rever Reverend Robert Neville, Dean of Marsh Chapel, delivers the benediction. In a world older than ancient and vaster than can be conceived, whose main forces are impersonal blasts of cosmic gases, God has created a complex but singular work of human scale at Boston University. May we give thanks. How comforting and also terrifying it is to know that what we do makes a difference in this beautiful enterprise. May we give thanks. How honored we are to have as our president, Robert A. Brown. May we give thanks. Now let us leave this ceremony with the resolve to support him with our wisdom, energy, and talents, knowing that we are all accountable in ultimate perspective for what we do with our lives. May God bless President Brown and his family as we give thanks for all those who preceded him in this office. May God bless Boston University in its new day as we give thanks for its legacy. May God bless the world whose welfare we would serve as we give thanks for our corporate future. This sacred moment is a pivot on which turn important things. Reflect on this and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. With the 10th president of Boston University now duly installed, I declare this inauguration ceremony to be concluded. On behalf of the university's board of trustees, I thank you for your attendance at this important occasion. We invite each of you to join us now in a, at a reception in honor of our new president. We ask that you remain at your seats until the platform party, the faculty, and the honored members of the academic procession have left the auditorium. <laughs> 